Samantha Brown, host from the Travel Channel, on this episode of Travel Television. A site for helping abandoned and injured animals in Mexico on web tips. Making a difference for remote villages in Nicaragua in this episode. We continue our visit to Belgium with Mark Murphy of Travel Tribe. All this and more, so on to our first stop. The Roberto Clemente Santa Ana Health Clinic, launched in 2004, provides free and low-cost medical care to needy families in the villages of Limon and Tula on the remote Pacific coast of Nicaragua. There are volunteer opportunities for U.S. medical students and others who donate their time in the clinic and with the local educational and prevention programs. Students from George Washington University recently spent their break making a difference in this community. Um, what was it like? Mm -hmm. It was great. Great. Everyone was fantastic. All the people, the doctor, the Ernesto, Juan, Martita, Martina, everyone was great. Well, this organization started in 2004 with the idea of one of the founders, Julia Gath, who visited Nicaragua many times and in a very remote area to discover that was very poor uh, healthcare facilities for this community. Uh, the first hospital from where our clinic is is kind of located one, one hour, one hour and a half for any emergencies. So this came as a idea, a brainstorm idea from the founders. Well, I think this program was a great opportunity for us to see um, what health problems exist in developing countries or countries that are struggling with healthcare systems as a whole. And coming here to Nicaragua, especially, um, it's an environment where you can see how a clinic operates and what the needs are in the community. So I think it's a great opportunity uh, to learn and to help at the same time. So far, volunteers have come from as far away as England, Canada, and many states in the U.S. The gamut of skills that college students and senior professionals have already brought to the clinic's communities range from teaching first aid, nutrition programs, hygiene education, deworming programs, and dental and surgical brigades that come to the clinic on a regular basis. These experiences exemplify what a volunteer can do for this clinic in this community. And um, when we went to Purify the Wealth, the children came along with us and they would they were so excited about doing it themselves and they would like count along how many spoons full do you need to do and you know they would like all, it was just fantastic it was so rewarding this 1240 square foot primary care and triage facility is staffed by a full-time doctor three nurses two pharmacists four administrative team members and a driver the clinic supplies low-cost medical care to the isolated villages of limon and 27 surrounding communities of southwest Nicaragua. The clinic is named for Roberto Clemente, who played baseball for the Pittsburgh Pirates from 1955 to 1972. Launched in 2004, the clinic is a result of generous donations from private individuals and the contributions of volunteers. When the doors opened the first year, the clinic had a part-time doctor and approximately 300 patients. Now they treat more than 13,000 patients per year. 2010, we were able with the, you know, private donations, you know, people like you and, and Liana who come with 40, 100 dollars, we were able to to purchase the first ambulance in the area. Oh wow! And ultrasound. And Just recently, the first ultrasound. Exactly. That's exciting. This year, we were able to buy an ultrasound, which is very important for diagnostic uh, all kind of disease. And the ambulance is very important because it has been saving so many lives. You cannot imagine uh, all the critical cases that come to the clinic and they really, really, you know, this community of Limon in Nicaragua, which is at the southwest of Nicaragua, is very, very thankful of that we have the clinic and that they have an ambulance. As the number of volunteers has increased drastically, so has the ability of this clinic to grow its outreach program. It was an amazing experience and the part that I think I got the most out of is seeing public health work you know, on the ground. So it was just amazing that all these things we learn about in the classroom every day we got to see and do in Nicaragua with a rural community. I think 
there are certain stories that stand out. I mean, we got to do so much. We, um, we were able to teach lessons in schools to kids on nutrition and basic hygiene um, and water and sanitation. Thanks to the volunteers, we are able to reach outreach outside of the clinic to the community. And last year, we saw approximately uh, 9,000 patients and we add to uh, 4,000 more people that we were able to, to reach thanks to the volunteers. Uh, people can come any time of the year. As I mentioned, uh, we accept any profession. Doesn't have to be a medical profession. Could be uh, any career. You can come and help to the community. You can interact, as Liana was mentioning. Uh, we take them to the schools. We take them to the mini hospitals that we have in the community. If you are a medical background, this is a great experience for them to really you know, hand touch uh, what, how our people, our doctors treat patients. You, can, you don't have to be even in public health. You can be an uh, administrator or you can be any, any career can help us in some way. You may ask, how was the growth of this clinic possible? Well, in addition to monetary donations from individuals, the clinic receives the donation of time and resources from many volunteers around the world. The driving force behind its success is the volunteer program. When you volunteer abroad, it's not only the people in need who benefit. Volunteers enjoy powerful feelings of purpose and a strong sense of accomplishment. Volunteering abroad in Nicaragua offers the opportunity to experience other cultures, to learn things not found in books or classrooms, and to gain a new perspective of the world we live in. So when people go to, the, to the, our website, it's called uh, www.nicaclinic.org, and they can find the information and just contact immediately, and we tell them that you know, they can go any time of the year, and we, they were, they're welcome. Samantha Brown is one of the most popular hosts on the Travel Channel. She has been on the road over 200 days in the past year. Travel Television spoke to her when she visited Washington, D.C. We've never done a voluntourism trip where the entire trip was dedicated, but what we always try to sh uh, showcase is how even uh, one day of your trip, one hour of your trip, can make a difference. We've certainly seen that from our own viewers that um, people are they're being able to travel more. And of course, they've worked a lot to, to uh, afford that vacation. So there's this need of saying, you know, I deserve this. But there's always this sense of we are privileged to travel. So how do we pay that forward? How do we thank people for um, the opportunity we have to be in their country? And how do we give back, not just take as consumers? So um, for instance, in um, Southeast Asia, uh, it's really um, easy, enjoyable thing to do, voluntourism. Um, you can do anything from in Cambodia. We simply brought um, notebooks and pencils to every school we visited. Um, we also spent the day at an orphanage, um, bringing all of our crew members, our sound, mem uh, sound man, cameraman, we brought our shampoos and our soaps from the hotel because that was something that they didn't have. So just those little acts that we think nothing of mean the world to other people. And so um, we always try when we can to show how just even in an hour, even in a day, you can give back to a community that you're visiting. Exploring the city, I discovered La Esperanza Granada. It's an organization of volunteers from around the globe who help educate local kids. Now anyone can go on one of La Esperanza's weekly visits to a local village school. And Carolyn, one of the volunteers, asked me to accompany her. So what does uh, La Esperanza mean? Hope Granada. Hope Granada. Yeah. And we're walking in a pueblo that you're bringing yeah, hope to. Yeah, this is La Prusia. It's a pueblo only about three kilometers outside of Granada. Uh -huh. Has about 300 homes. And living conditions are very harsh. Mm -hmm. Do mm -hmm. they have electricity? They do get electricity. They mostly have televisions. And um, running water is about three times a week for five hours a day. Wow. Yeah. I guess it's recess. Yep, this is the Prusia recess. <laughs> Doesn't matter what country you're in, recess is the same. It's a big deal. They got soccer going on, jump rope. And this is really what La Esperanza is all about, the schools. Absolutely. We um, tutor 
One-on-one, -on -one, whenever we get the chance to take a kid out of a classroom, okay. mainly in math and reading. Okay, so the teachers then are Nicaraguan. Correct, it's their public schools. And you are working with the Nicaraguan government or their idea of the school system. Right, they've invited us in to help improve their educational system as best as we can. Just walking in here, the environment completely changes. I mean, it's colorful, it's bright, yeah. it's... it's yeah. Jovial, if yeah. I may we help them build, uh, paint all the murals. It really has changed the atmosphere of their educational environment. It's fun now. So what's for lunch? So we're preparing the typical um, gallo pinto, which is rice and sure. beans and, <laughs> and tortillas <laughs> with. Uh, is that what's for lunch? Tortillas. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So but school lunch will also bring up the attendance. Absolutely, as well. it's definitely a reason why many kids come to school. It's just amazing what I've taken for granted by going to school, having a good meal, and clothes to wear. You've traveled around the world. Your next volunteer vacation, where would you where would you go? Oh, that's such a good question. I um, mean, I loved Southeast Asia, but certainly uh, even in um, Latin America, which is even closer, Honduras, uh, Nicaragua, um, wonderful opportunities, and even right in my own backyard, um, Habitat for Humanity. That's another uh, huge organization that I think people think of as, well, I have to dedicate my a lot of time to build an entire home, when really they accept day people. So down in New Orleans, we showed that you could just show up for the day and help out. And uh, so uh, I just went online to see anything, uh, a Habitat for Humanity project that was going on in my area. And I'm so happy because I've located one. And so I'm going to call them and see what I can do. So it might not necessarily be on camera, but I like to do these things on my own as well. Despite the weather conditions, who've been coming out just trying to lend a hand to find any way that they can reach out into the community and just uh, provide whatever help they can to make things a little bit better. We've had people come from all over the central part of the United States, the upper Midwest. We have equipment that's come from as far away as Iowa and southern Minnesota. And uh, today, on Saturday, uh, this is the largest volunteer turnout that we've had. We've had uh, at least 2,000 people come through our system already, and we expect many more. Important uh, that individuals call 211 and talk to someone before they come to get additional information or to go to 211 Missouri.org Missouri uh, website that can provide updated information uh, about um, our current status here. And also, um, I just want to say this is going to be an ongoing effort. We're going to need people for weeks and months uh, as we transition from this emergency response phase into the recovery phase. There are going to be opportunities for everyone of some type. Known as Amigos de los Animales in Spanish, or Isla Animals in English, this organization is made up of eager volunteers, local residents, capable medical staff, concerned visitors, involved city officials, and so many more. 
They are comprised of everyone who cares about our animal population and are striving to make a positive difference. The organization helps abandoned pets on Isla Mujeres in Mexico on the Mayan Riviera. The staff speaks English and is willing to take as many or as few hours as individuals or groups can volunteer. Their goal is to decrease the unwanted pet population on Isla Mujeres, Mexico through ongoing spay and neuter programs, education, vaccinations, and adoption. Without a foreseeable end to the overpopulation of unwanted and or uncared for dogs and cats on Isla Mujeres, the current solution that the local government has resorted to is periodic roundups of any animal found in the street and instant elimination of these animals. This is the rule, not the exception. This is why the animals need our help. Allison Current is the leader of this organization and she currently holds the Island Animals Project together. To the locals, she is known as a near saint who fosters all the dogs on North Beach. Together with her husband Jeff and with endless help from a few local residents, she has opened her home to literally hundreds of homeless pups on Isla. After fostering up to 40 dogs at a time, Allison created the Dog Gone Foundation, an adoption program that has placed hundreds of beautiful pups in loving homes. Allison is grateful to all volunteers who come to help her walk, feed, bathe, and love the dogs, and is always anxious to hear from potential volunteers. Allison can be reached at bayfirestd at aol.com or through her website, islaanimals.org. The list of things that make Belgium famous is pretty long and beer is close to the top of it. For anyone who likes a cold brew, a tasting in Belgium is a must stop. There are approximately 125 breweries in Belgium and they produce over 650 different beers. But where should you start when trying out Belgian beers? I say the Lambic. It's a traditional Belgian beer that comes in all sorts of styles. One of these is exposed to over 300 grams of cherries per liter, so it's got a pretty sweet taste. The other tastes range from very different to pretty recognizable, but definitely distinct. Beer is an art in Belgium. Well, you know what we ought to do? We actually ought to go and not just taste it, we actually ought to go get some of the background on some of these Belgian beers. The Cantillon Brewery in Brussels has been in business since 1900 and brews nine distinct beers, many of these even using local fruits as well as flowers to make a fragrant, sweet, colorful brew. Of course, anyone can buy the beers here, but the real treat is learning what about the brewing process makes Belgian beers so unique. So you get to drink this stuff, right? It's kind of cool to actually come in and check out how it's made, right? Well, first thing they do is they take the grains and they mill them above us right here. And then, They've been doing this mashing since about 1920. The brewery goes back to 1900, but the mashing process takes place in here. That's about a three or four hour process. After the grains are mashed, they then run liquid through them and pump that liquid upstairs to another vat. And I'm gonna show you that and tell you what happens then. All right, so you have the mashing process and then you have the boiling process. That takes place up here. Three to four hour process. They add the hops right here. And after that three to four hour process, it's pumped upstairs. And that's really where the magic begins and what makes Belgian beer unique. You saw where it was boiled. Here's where it ends up at the end of the day. At 103 degrees, it comes into this large copper tub, which is very low profile to allow a lot of exposure to the air. Because the way this building is built, it has these slats which allows the air itself to come in. Why is the air important? That's where the yeast is. So this is a completely natural process where the yeast interacts with the liquid in the process of forming the beer. The natural process is unique, especially when you compare it to how traditional ales and lagers are fermented with very particular yeast. What's the next stop for a Belgian beer? Let's find out in the barrel room. Hey, Alberto. Hello. All right, so we've gone from the, the big Copper tub yes. to the barrels. Yes. Tell us the process. So once it's cooled down, we pump it into the barrels and here it will start its fermentation process. It might look like a wine cellar, but this barrel room is full of beer. Here, the Cantillon brews rest for years. During that time, fresh whole fruits like raspberries, apples, 
and even cherries are added to the barrels to create strong and distinct flavors. After that, the beers are actually strained, left to sit a little longer, and then sent into the world for beer lovers everywhere to enjoy. And isn't this the point of the entire process? I mean, I love learning about the beer, but there's nothing quite like sitting back and sipping one. proud of our history and natural surroundings, but what would happen if we didn't take care of it? With the ongoing traffic chaos and pollution, still people continue to go about their daily lives, with only a few of them really grasping the importance in protecting our environment. I've been involved with a group called The Green Team, based in Scotland's capital. So we're the Green Team, we're a voluntary organisation um, and we're also a charity, an environmental charity. Um, I suppose our history is that we started in 1995 as a project of the Duke of Edinburgh Awards. Um, there didn't seem to be enough environmental opportunities for young people to get involved in as part of their Duke of Edinburgh Award and the Green Team was really born as a project of that. But since then we've kind of grown into our own organisation um, and we have lots of different sorts of projects going on. Um, throughout the year, well really from February to November when we consider that the weather's nice enough for us to actually go outside and do some practical work. Our projects are really led by volunteers, so there are staff members involved in the Green Team, but it's really the volunteers who actually lead the projects um, and make it happen. So they give up their weekends to come out with young people. They work with uh, groups of um, young adults to conserve and protect the natural environment and they can do this through part of the Duke of Edinburgh Award or through the John Muir Trust Award um, and we get involved in getting outdoors in places and using public spaces and parks and help to conserve these places. I think the group's really great for uh, helping young people to, to find a voice and to grow in self-confidence and build more skills the team leader's main responsibility is to ensure the health and safety and well-being of the young people participating. I think it's vital. Um, and also just to encourage and maybe encourage people to participate and to get involved where maybe they wouldn't normally. Before the programme would, would begin, we would um, liaise with the Green Team uh, volunteer leaders, um, coordinators, to try and establish um, you know, what, they, what they really require from us. Um, so it works both ways, i.e. we get a bit of uh, additional help to manage our sites and they also get a bit of um, kind of expertise or, or input into the natural environment. Well the John Muir Award is part of the John Muir Trust um, and they are the leading um, wildland uh, conservation charity in the UK and so they want to encourage people to protect and, uh, and look after wildlands and so they've started the, the award as a way of getting young people into kind of caring about wildlands and wild places. Um, the award has got um, four different uh, aspects to it. You've got to discover and explore somewhere, you've got to do something to conserve it and you've got to share your experiences. So every day that you come on a green team project you can uh, obviously discover and explore a wild place, you get to uh, do something kind of good to put something back to the area and you can tell everyone about your experiences. The minimum kind of time limit for the, for the discovery award is four days and so if you come for four days for the green team then that counts towards your, your first level discovery level. We did Duke of Edinburgh and they came and did a talk about green team to us and it sounded quite fun and it was a good way of doing our service. We also run residential weekends, so we'd leave on a Saturday morning, um, we'd stay overnight and we'd come back um, on Sunday evening. I think it's really important if you're learning about teamwork and working together and um, being more positive and developing certain attitudes to actually have that trust that they build up together is really beneficial. So we're out at the Penton Hills going up uh, quite high, um, clearing some drainage ditches along the paths there. So we took a group of young people out, um, walked them up a very steep part of the Pentlands um, so that they could do some footpath repairs. Things like that the rangers don't always get out to do and they need quite a, a big workforce to actually go out and, and help them with that. There's three different types of drainage we'll be clearing out. Um, we've got cross drains, which you might have seen when you're coming up. It's basically two sets of stones that run parallel with a gap between. 
So with these ones, you just clear out the stones and the debris in between it. You've also got water bars, which are just a line of stones, tin like cobbles, and you've got a bit of little bricks, and they're in a line, and you just put to one side, and then down the slope, just make a little channel. Now all of these drains, have already got channels and things, but it's starting to get blocked up, so you're just really scraping away what's there already. I like it because, yeah, you can see the difference that you make. And it's quite good that it's all like children, young people who are, actually can be bothered to go out. So to get involved in the green team, um, you have to be between the ages of 14 and 25. Um, we've got a programme of activities that you can find out about either through leaflets that are handed out through schools and youth groups, um, or you can go to www.greenteam.org.uk and find out all about the different projects that, that we have running. I really recommend them to come because it's absolutely great fun. You don't have to travel to the Gulf Coast to volunteer your time and enthusiasm. You can be a virtual volunteer at TravelTelevision.org. We need people to help us with our web development and maintenance. We need writers, producers, video editors, artists, and anyone who has expertise in outreach and marketing. Make a difference by volunteering with this nonprofit organization and you'll be giving a much needed virtual boost to the volunteers in Louisiana and Mississippi. Please email us at IWantToHelpAtTravelTelevision.org.